Morning all, this is just a hopefully fairly short screencast on the notes on tangential flow filtration or also called cross flow filtration or cross flow microfiltration, lots of different names. I think in the future I'll settle with tangential flow filtration. I think it's probably more appropriate. Um, so just to go back to the document I gave you at the start of BE321 on um, membrane process in general, uh, and just to put some context on what we're talking about now in terms of, of um, tangential flow filtration. I've just called it in this case microfiltration. So uh, the tangential flow systems are generally microfiltration. So they're they're looking at separating uh, separating out particles that are of the order of a micron in size. So uh, that's one by ten to the minus six meters or one thousandth of a millimeter. So around the range of, of bacteria. Um, so that's why they're called microfilters, to kind of filter clots that you would have seen, say, on the rotary vacuum filter in one of the videos on dead end filtration. They tend to be much more porous, and that's why you have to use filter aid on them to actually act as the, the de facto filter. But cross flow um, techniques like microfiltration or tangential flow filtration, um, to dis first of all, to distinguish them from ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis. The first thing is that the pore size is obviously a lot bigger than ultrafilters because ultrafilters you're dealing with filtration at the molecular level and nanofiltration you're going down further again down to kind of molecules with molecular weights of in the hundreds rather than the thousands and then reverse osmosis you're talking about thousands um, and it's interesting that as the size of the thing you're trying to separate out increases or decreases um, the, the pressures you need to generate kind of workable filtration rates um, get bigger and bigger. So reverse osmosis is a very high pressure um, type of system. Nanofiltration, um, a little bit lower. Um, and nanofiltration has been a real buzz topic in recent years because people are talking about using it for waste treatment in particular because it can remove things that are called endocrine disruptors. They're the molecules that and get into the, our, our drinking water and the like and affect um, sexual organs and things like that. It's been shown to affect um, sexual organs in, in fish, for example, these molecules. Um, so nanofiltration is, is being looked at in, in that context. But the fact that it uses very high pressures uh, means there's a cost factor. Ultrafiltration then tends to be kind of at the low end of the pressure rate range, but still up to up to 10 bar or so. And then microfiltration is probably a low to medium um, pressure uh, process because the, the pore sizes of the membranes are bigger and the particles are, are bigger. So, so that's what we're talking about. Um, in terms of, of how um, microfiltration or cross flow filtration systems are set up relative to ultrafiltration, well, the, the way tangential flow systems are operated is exactly the same as ultrafiltration. So, um, and obviously, to, just to, to remind you that in dead end filtration, the feed is going at the, the filter, whereas in tangential flow, the feed is flowing tangential to the membrane and you get a much thinner cake that tends to have a little bit of a shape like this. Um, so there, you know, the advantages are obviously that you've got a, a thinner cake here. Um, but the, the way you operate a tangential flow system is exactly the same as, as an ultrafilter. All that's different is the membrane in here. So um, a lot of the, the equipment for tangential flow filtration looks identical to that for reverse osmosis or nanofiltration or ultrafiltration. It's all about the membrane. That's the only difference. <clears throat> now, in reality, um, Tangential flow filtration is actually a newer technology than ultrafiltration. Ultrafiltration used to was really developed around um, the 1950s, 1960s, when um, the, the physical chemistry of, of membrane manufacture um, was developed, and it was found possible to be able to make what are called asymmetric membranes, which meant that you could, you might just Google that, um, so you could construct membranes that were the, the structure of which was such that they could filter out molecules, but they didn't have massive resistances to flow. Uh, so that made ultrafiltration a very successful technology as far back as the 60s. It took a, long, a lot longer for microfilters to, to take hold, and I'll show you some pictures of those in a second. Um, but, and so 
um, tangential flow filtration hasn't percolated into industry to the same extent as ultrafiltration has. And there, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, and one of those is that when you're dealing with solid systems, solid liquid systems, everything is far more unpredictable than it is when you're dealing with molecules. And you know, issues like clogging of membranes and all that become a really big factor when you're dealing with, with, with um, particulate filtration processes. Uh, and we'll talk later that there, there are ways or how you can deal with that, particularly when you're using cross-flow filtration for, for waste treatment. We'll talk about very briefly things called um, membrane bioreactors, which are, have really taken hold in the waste treatment business. So anyway, in, in theory, you can have single pass um, tangential flow systems. You can have uh, feed and bleed systems, but you don't really tend to see these uh, except in membrane bioreactors, which I'll talk about, but they're, they're, they're significantly modified to make them capable of long lasting operation without fouling up very quickly. Um, and the most common use of um, tangential flow filtration in kind of process industries would be batch processes where, you know, you can either have a simple batch process like that or one with a recycle, recirculation loop to boost the flux. Um, so here the, the process is, or the purpose of the process is to increase the concentration of your suspension. Um, and then subsequently you might dye a filter, might dye a filter the suspension. And then at that point, it depends on what kind of product you have. Sometimes the product is intracellular. And at this stage after dye filtration, your, your suspension, you might break open the cells in a homogenizers or a bead mill or something to extract the the, uh, the product of interest but but the, the key thing to get is that it's it's really the exact same type of technology it's just the membranes are different and some of the underlying mechanisms are are, are different and also the, the the nature of the the suspensions that mem tangential flow filtration is applied to means that they can be very prone to to plugging up so the actual pores of the membranes get get uh, blocked so the membranes have to be replaced fairly frequently and that's obviously a cost factor <clears throat> okay so we, let's go back to the notes themselves here's some pictures of of micro filters and um, these would be classic ones used for research where the pores are very well defined and so you can conduct studies to investigate the effect of porosity of the membrane and pore structure or pore uh, diameter on things like fluxes but most of them are this kind of sponge shape um, and it's interesting when you think of people talking about masks in terms of covid and people talk oh the pore size of the mask is much bigger than the virus it's it's never that simple you know it, and there's there's a probability element to, to everything in, in membrane transport that you know it, it really depends on the actual trajectory of of the particle as to whether it gets captured or not. And of course, there's all sorts of variation in the pore sizes, and a particle might happen to come along a smaller pore than or indeed a bigger pore. So, you know, and it, it's never as simple as people portray it. And here's a nice cross section of the um, of a membrane and you can see the, the pore structure. I think this is a ceramic one. Ceramic membranes are much more sturdy than, than say something like cellulose acetate. Cellulose acetate is, is literally the, the, the material in an acetate that you know, we used to use on overhead projectors. PVDF, I can't pronounce polyvinyl difluoride or something. Um, and so, so that's what they look like. Actually, I might, just go back into um, because we've shortened semester this year. I haven't had the time to talk about membrane structure so much, but asymmetric membrane structure. Let's go to images. Um, let me get a good. Well, there's a schematic of one. So the structure of an, an asymmetric membrane you see let's go back here first see the way these are actually symmetric so no matter what cross section of the membrane you take it, it kind of looks the same but asymmetric membranes have this kind of porous structure 
um, and then a, a much more dense structure um, at the surface. And the dense structure is what does all the separating, if you like. And then the porous sublayer just acts, provides mechanical strength to, to the thing. Um, and it was in the 1950s that this type of membrane was developed. And it's not like this bit is stuck onto that bit. This kind of asymmetry um, emerges from the physical chemistry of the process used to make the membrane. And this was, I can't pronounce the guy's name, Lieb and Surijan, I think they were, um, who invented this type of membrane. And so it had great separation capacity, but also had good mechanical strength. And all of this very porous bit meant that the resistance to flow of this bit was negligible. So you didn't have a massively thick, dense membrane. You did quite a thin uh, separation part and then just did all this very porous bit. Um, so ironically, these were developed before the, the symmetric ones. So that's why ultrafiltration really became a thing before tangential flow filtration. Um, so these are the standard. The cellulose acetate would be one of the most common used in microfiltration and PVDF as well. The ceramic ones, I had, I did a lot of research with a ceramic membrane. Well, one of my PhD students did. Um, it was a really nice little rig. I don't know what happened. But we used to use it for, I think when we moved to the X building, um, it got wrecked. <laughs> Oh, no, it didn't actually. We used it for, did I use it? I ran a couple of fourth year projects. In fact, some of the data from those fourth year projects um, is in my book. So I forget the student's name, Brian something, did some nice work. Anyway, so let's talk about what cross flow microfiltration or tangential flow filtration is for. And you know, when, when this technology was first um, invented, so to speak, everybody said, oh, it's much better than dead end filtration because you've you've got much thinner cakes and then you're going to get much higher fluxes. But there are two different technologies trying to do different things. I mean, for example, a crossflow filter would not produce a filter cake. And sometimes the filter cake is the product. What if what a dead end filter would, or what a crossflow filter will do is it'll it'll produce a concentrated liquid, a concentrated suspension. So you might be looking to concentrate your suspension or you might be looking to, to produce clear liquid, which you might be doing in dead end filtration. But, but you know, fundamentally, they're, they're quite different things um, in the sense that a lot of dead end filtration is about uh, recovering a cake. And I remember when I was down in Pfizer's years ago when they used to make citric acid, they used to recover the citric acid on huge rotary vacuum filters. So. The, the solid on the filters was their product. So you can't get a solid product with a tangential flow system. It's all about concentrating um, your suspension or perhaps recovering a clear filtrate. So something like sterilizing a process, process stream to remove bacteria, um, that might be an important thing, or you might use an ultrafiltration then to, to remove viruses. Then you might have diafiltration, and then you obviously to concentrate your solution. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to labour on all of those. That's that's there in the notes for you. But just to to um, show you a typical scenario when you switch on a cross flow filter and you're operating at constant concentration, you have a constant feed concentration, and you can do that at at a lab scale quite easily using a little trick. I won't go into that at the moment. But this is what happens. So you get a drop in flux over time and here you see the way we have a, a time here is around 100 minutes two hours or so and while at the same time the, the cake mass goes up here and you can see from this data that even though the flux is declining here the cake mass is constant so what that really means is that there's something going on in the membrane itself so there's an extra re resistance building up and um, that's not due to cake formation it might be down to maybe plugging of the membrane pores themselves but the interesting thing about this is, is how slow things happen in cross-flow uh, microfiltration of, of suspensions. If you turn on an ultrafilter, it instantaneously reaches what we can call a steady state flux. So it, it, it only takes seconds and the, the flux is established. But the dynamics, if you like, of, of a microfilter are much slower. So you get this flux decline. So when you talk about flux, you have to be very careful of 
what fluoxamine. And normally, um, in an ideal world, this will level off and that will refer to that as your steady state flux. But it might take a while to be established. And that's a big difference between ultrafiltration and uh, microfiltration, the, the, the rapidity at which the flux reaches a, a steady state. Um, and that's a log scale, I hadn't noticed that. Okay. <clears throat> Again, the, the driving force is, is the transmembrane pressure, and I've kind of more formally defined it here compared to ultrafiltration, but it's, essentially it's the average pressure difference across the membrane. Um, and the interesting thing is, if you plot the steady state flux against pressure, you get something a bit like you get in ultrafiltration. But remember in ultrafiltration, we said that we get this absolutely um, universal behavior no matter what kind of molecule you're filtering you if you plot the flux which establishes instantly versus the the transmembrane pressure the flux increases and then flattens out so you get this what we call the limiting flux and that you see that with everything polysaccharides proteins you name it and certainly if you go to high enough pressures but with solids again the whole thing is a little bit more messy and you can see here that we don't quite see that. We kind of see it at, at very high concentrations, but you know the overall message you get if, if you read the literature on cross-flow filtration is that we don't have any kind of universal concepts that, that you can apply in the same way as you can with ultrafiltration. So, and sometimes you get a kind of a plateau effect, sometimes you don't. It really depends on the suspension you're working with <coughs> and also the range of, of pressures you're using and basically all kinds of stuff and um, we don't really have any good theories as to that will describe all systems um, we're not even close to it we, there was a period during the 90s where people thought well we can sort of use a lot of the concentration polarization ideas of ultrafiltration and apply it to particles but it, it never really panned out even if some of the papers that were written were just were really lovely papers, but they just, they were too idealized and never really worked in practice. Um, so basically, because it's a particular process, we're talking about a fluid flow problem. Um, so the flux is written as the, the pressure drop over mu times the resistance of the membrane, which can be substantial now in cross-flow microfiltration, um, unlike dead-end filtration where the RM is, is effectively negligible plus the specific resistance of the, the cake times the cake mass per unit area. Um, and what makes cross-flow microfiltration difficult is that the M there, the cake mass, is, is typically very hard to measure. I mean, I showed you this data. The student who did this data, Tony McCarthy, he's, he was a fantastic experimentalist, although he was the most untidy experimenter I've ever seen in my life. He just was, his lab was like a tip, but he had a little space where every, he did things so meticulously, but he was surrounded by junk. <laughs> He's an incredibly intelligent guy. Um, but, um, but he managed to work out the cake mass, um, even though, the, remember, the, the mass is inside your cartridge and it's very small, so he had to infer it by taking other measurements and to, they're just excellent experiments. But in general, you don't know what the M is. And crucially, you can't re relate it to the filtrate volume like you do in dead-end filtration. So it, it's um, this can only be taken so far. And I'll talk a little bit, maybe I might split this screencast in two, a little bit how you might go about modeling um, cross-flow filtration using the kind of standard models of, of dead-end filtration. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is the effect of cross flow velocity or tangential flow velocity. And remember we said that one of the key indicators that ultrafiltration was a mass transfer process was that when we varied the tangential flow rate in ultrafiltration, we found two very specific relationships between flux and tangential flow rate, depending on where, whether the tangential flow was laminar or turbulent. And in laminar flow, we found that the flux was proportional to tangential flow rate to the power of 0.33 or 1 over 3. And in turbulent flow, it was proportional to tangential flow rate to the 0.8. Um, and that's, that's a really clear divide. Now, obviously, if you're in 
kind of a transition between turbulent and laminar you might get different um, exponents and um, but that that was a general observation which kind of made people believe that mass transfer was the underlying mechanism of ultrafiltration but when you do the same experiments in um, cross flow tangential flow or tangential flow filtration it your data is all over the place it, it really there's no way of predicting what the dependence of uh, flux on tangential velocity is going to be. It's, it really depends on what you're filtering, the, the pressure you're operating at, the concentration range you're working with. It, it really is all over the shop. And again, that's typical of, of, of suspensions. And we'll see when we talk about centrifugal suspensions um, next time. Um, it, it's You just don't have the kind of certainty around mechanisms when you're dealing with suspensions as when you're dealing with, with solutions of molecules. Um, another thing about dead end or cross flow filtration that's quite interesting is that you find that the, the specific resistance of cakes that you get in cross flow filtration tends to be bigger than the value you get in dead end filtration. Um, and there are basically two reasons for that. I mean, the, the first one is this phenomenon called preferential deposition. And it's, this is a phenomenon where, if you think of your typical suspension, a typical suspension contains particles, right? But not all particles have the same size. You've got big ones, you've got small ones, even when you're dealing with, with microbes. And it turns out that when fluid flows, a suspension flows over a membrane tangentially, if you analyze the forces acting on the particles, there's a kind of a tangential force dragging the particle along the membrane. And there's a the flux of filtrate through the membrane is, is dragging the particle towards the membrane. It turns out if, if you work through the little analysis on those forces, you find that it, it turns out that smaller the smaller the particle the more likely it is to deposit on the membrane so when you're dealing with suspensions that have a range of particle sizes in them you find that the cross flow filter cake contains relatively more of the smallest particles in that suspension and we know from our dead end filtration theory that the smaller the particles the greater the specific resistance so that effect leads to this that your cross flow um, specific resistance is greater than your dead end specific resistance and that's part of the reason why to some extent the performance of tangential flow filtration has been a bit disappointing because it the, the flux declines you see at this um, in a filtration process are often very severe so that your steady state flux is actually um uneconomically low and even though the cake itself is very thin and um, because you get this this fact that the cross flow dead end or the cross flow specific resistance tends to be enhanced it's part of the reason why you get um lower than expected flux the other reason is that and I, actually the more i look at this picture over the years the less convinced i am but let me see I remember reading this paper, said that's amazing. But if you, this is a cross flow um, or a cross section of a filter cake of, of E. coli, I think, certainly a rod shaped bacterium. And this is at a low cross flow velocity. So this stuff is flowing slowly tangentially to memory. And you can see there's a certain amount of randomness as to the orientation of the particles. There is a tendency for them to stratify tangentially to the, the membrane. Um, but that, that at a higher cross flow velocity, that effect is much more, more obvious. You can see that the cells are aligning up along tangential to the membrane. I mean, this big clump, that could be just an artifact of the, um, the scanning electron microscopy. But you'd also see these big macro pores and all sorts of stuff. But I think it's probably... I suppose it's it's not that convincing, <laughs> but I think you could probably say that there's more stratification of the, the particles here at high velocity than there is at this at low velocity. And it turns out that that kind of structure is more dense and that also contributes to 
the higher cross flow velocity. In fact, the, the paper where this appeared, it was a very short paper, it's years ago now since I, I read it. Uh, they actually measured specific resistance, I think, and found that the specific resistance of this type of structure was much more than this, higher than this, which um, uh, led to this concept of that the, in general the cross flow and dead end or cross flow specific resistance is going to be greater than the, the dead end one, particularly if you've got rod like organisms. So, what I might do is just stop there because I want many minutes away into this. And the next bit I'm going to do is a little bit technical, but it, this is one of the most important things um, in the history of. Um, I suppose the theory of, of cross flow microfiltration and also the um, the practice of cross flow filtration. It's, it's a really interesting idea. And funny enough, I did my PhD on this stuff and um, I kind of stumbled on this, but didn't know I'd stumbled on it and kind of just passed it off as some sort of curiosity. But in fact, and I didn't really yet call it anything. And then somebody else published the same idea, but they backed it up with a load of experiments as well, and it became one of the most cited uh, concepts in cross flow uh, filtration theory. So it just shows you that's the difference between people like me who kind of, well, I was stumbling around at the time trying to come up with new stuff, and somebody who had much more um, insight into the big picture at that stage, but I was young. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm going to stop there and I'm going to do another one now in a few minutes and we can uh, just to split these things up for you. Okay.